Students, after a while, and it doesn't take very long, are very used to studenting. They're very used to, this is how I'm supposed to act as a student. I listen to the teacher give me information. I might try it on my own, then I might practice it, and then I might do homework, and then I take a test on it. But that really doesn't build students who can think through their processes and through the math that they're working with. There's three things that you need to do to help students get away from their stereotypical idea of studenting. And a lot of it is subconscious of studenting. They wanted to ask her for help constantly. They waited until she was close by. They just sat there and just got frustrated very fast and then started to give up. One thing is create random groups and random groups should be for middle school and high school, three per group, and do it every single class. And have it be visibly random. So the students know that you aren't planning, oh, this group this child will be with this child and they can help them. And so they become used to their jobs, their perceived jobs of how to be a student in a group. Another thing to do, as you can see around my classroom, is to put the groups of students standing at whiteboards for basically every single task. And so that way, they're having to communicate with each other. They have other people's ideas that they can listen to, and they can share their ideas with others. So a lot of times, students don't want to work by themselves because they might not feel like they understand it. But if they are in a group, then they feel more comfortable with trying new things, trying to figure out how things work, etc. The third thing is um, have rich tasks that the students work on. If they have rich tasks, they're, mo they're more than just do this computation. So there are rich tasks that might go into this and that and this and bringing all these different areas of math together. And so some of them might take 30 minutes where we normally think of math sometimes as, well, it's short and we can do it. And no, sometimes they might take into another class, depending on how many tasks you have and what is involved. A lot of math is stories and you can incorporate a story into the math problem and that helps to make it rich tasks. Peter Liliadal says in order for students to stop their traditional studenting behaviors, you have to give them non-curricular tasks first. They're still mathematical, but they don't have to do officially with the curriculum that they're studying at that point in time. So that's, that, that's, that was really fun. And the kids were like, oh, this is fun. Oh, that's fun. But then we got more, once they're used to the standing, used to the talking to each other, um, at first it was quiet. And it was like encouraging them. What could they say to each other? How could they participate? How could they ask questions of each other? Um, so there was a lot of just encouraging and talking about how are you when you're in a group that makes a group good. Um, and so that became our class rules. And so they helped construct those. But not just, it took time because I also wanted them to understand what was important for a group because they're in a group every single class. And, and it's a different group, and they don't know who that group, those group members are gonna be. But I'll think, periodically I'll go, oh my gosh, they're just never stopping talking. What is the deal here? I'll go up and just listen to see, and 90% of the time they're talking about the math problem. 90% of the time. I have never had that in all the years I've taught math, never. I've had kids talk about math, but not to the same degree. I always introduce a problem at a board where the students are standing in front of the board. And I change the board because there's no front in my classroom. Um, and so I draw stuff and I only give them part of the story. And then I take it, some of it's verbal and then some of it is visual for them. And then they go to their boards and then periodically I'll give them more information, maybe on a different board. Or I'll say, okay, this is the next part 
And so they're having to constantly process, but I give it all to them at the same time, it gets overwhelming. One of the problems that they're working on right now, actually, is to compare two cell phone plans, and it's to make sure that they understand a, rate, a proportional table, so that's incorporated into it, making sure that they know how to use and understand equivalent ratios. And then we also talk a little bit about unit rates for this, because, well, how much, because it's the, the problem is a cell phone company has two plans that you can buy. So many texts cost so many dollars. And so they first look at plan A, and then they look at plan B, but they, it incorporates so many different parts of proportional reasoning. So we look at it first, do they notice any patterns? So I do a lot of what do you notice, what do you see, what do you have questions about? Now we're looking at which plan is the better one, and does each table show a proportion or not? And then we're transferring that to then, okay, can we create an equation for each table? And if we can't, why not? And then now can we create a graph to show what would happen and why we would want this plan versus that? So it's taking in all the different parts that are involved in grade seven. We walk around and they're able to watch another group and see what they've learned or how they're coming up with it if they're stuck. They can go talk to each other. They can go and find out things. They can say, I, I can look around and say, okay, you're stuck there. Instead of me giving the answers, why don't you go check out that group? Go see what they've done. Ask them questions if you need to. One of the things that I do notice about, and it might not seem like the traditional measuring, is that every student is engaged now. And so I know that they're all thinking and because of the rich tasks and because of some of the other activities that I've incorporated, um, based on the research that's in um, Lily Adal's book, is that even, it's really interesting to see how differentiated it becomes and the thinking processes and they ask better questions. Can you explain this to me or how do you know this is correct? And at first it was very, it was a big struggle for a lot of them of how to even answer that type of question. Whereas now they're much more comfortable. They can point things out, they can describe things. They even sometimes take a marker and draw something out for me now. It's so much fun to have them be so engaged and so excited about things. And when I say we have a new story, they all cheer. And yay, what's the story today? And yeah, I. Yesterday, when I introduced one of the things, I said, okay, so we're gonna go shopping. Yay! <laughs> I have no clue what they're shopping with. They have no idea what, the, but they're just like, yeah, another story. So they're very excited.